This is the northern end of the Wasatch Mountains uh, in northern Utah. This uh, really abrupt and steep mountain front runs all the way from southern Idaho uh, down to uh, central Utah, running through uh, some of the big cities in um, Utah, like Salt Lake City, Provo, Ogden, that sort of area. Um, we're high here in the Wasatch Mountains on a, a really nice day, uh, looking at the geology, getting a hike in, and I thought I'd do a little video that explains not just a little bit about uh, the big picture here geologically, but also um, there's a real interesting um, uh, contact or relationship between the rocks that are up here. And so the Wasatch Mountains have been pushed up over the last 15 million years or so by the, the Wasatch Fault, um, a large normal fault uh, that runs again from Idaho down to central Utah that pushes one side up, that's the mountainside, while it drops the Salt Lake Valley and these other valleys down. And you can kind of see as we look down this way, just sort of how abrupt uh, the transition is from the, the flat valley floor up to these mountains here. Really remarkable transition. This is where a lot of the ski resorts are in uh, northern Utah. Um, they get a tremendous amount of snow in this range. And so this north-south trending mountain range is here because over the last 15 million years, there's been east-west extension that's dropped the valley down and pushed the mountains up. Uh, that's what's happening here recently geologically. Um, we're going to look at some of the rocks that we have up here. We're not too far. Uh, the peak over here is uh, Ben Lomond, which is almost 10,000 feet tall. Uh, and then just over this ridge behind me, uh, we can't quite see it from here, is a peak called Willard Peak. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit on these rocks just below me here. If we actually look down the ridge, we can see some beige colored rocks, um, very hard resistant. Those are quartzites. They're actually quartzites from the Cambrian period, about 520 or so, 540-ish million years ago. Um, those were laid down, those, those rocks, those beige rocks are essentially sandstones. They're made out of sands dominated by quartz grains, and they were deposited on a beach. Uh, so this was the edge of North America at that time, and those are some of the sands that accumulated on that beach uh, in the ancient North American continent, again about 530, 540 million years ago. The little saddle you can see, uh, just where the beige rocks kind of end over here, um, those are, there's not rocks exposed there for the most part, but in that slope is a more fine grain unit called a shale. That's actually a unit called the Ophir Shale. Again, it's Cambrian in age. It's sitting on top of the sandstones, the quartzites, um, and it would have been deposited in a uh, offshore environment. So now imagine instead of being on the beach, we're in an environment that's a little bit deeper water, maybe tens to maybe up to 100 feet deep, where silt and mud is the dominant sediment size that's accumulating. Um, and then as you go up from those rocks, you get to these rocks here that are underneath my feet. These gray rocks here are uh, limestones, and limestones form at the bottom of the ocean uh, where the main thing that's being deposited on the seafloor is um, microorganisms. And so this is dominated by calcium carbonate. And this is mostly, again, like uh, microorganisms uh, and their shells and just accumulation of these. Limestones form usually in deeper water, so maybe several hundreds of feet deep. And so collectively, this slope, this ridge I'm on, and the ridge over there, which is a little bit easier to see, uh, the sandstone, the shale, and then the limestone uh, collectively forms what we call a transgressive sequence, meaning at this location here in northern Utah, we originally would have been on the beach when the sands were deposited, and then later in time, we would have been under maybe tens or maybe up to 100 feet of water when the shale was deposited. And then finally, we have these limestones here, which were deposited in several hundred feet of water. And so the idea is that the sea level was rising and we see this relationship or this type of sequence of rocks uh, everywhere when we look in the Cambrian. And that lets us know that that sea level rise was a global event. It wasn't just confined to North America or other regions. Uh, so pretty cool. The main thing I wanna look at here though is this quick transition between, so we've got these limestones here 
and I'm gonna walk up the slope uh, and we can see how this quickly this transition so we've got these gray Cambrian limestones okay and there's sort of a rule in geology that we just used as we looked at the rocks down there that you know rocks typically go from uh, oldest to youngest as you go from the bottom of the stack up 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 the stack right so as you go upwards the rocks typically get younger um, and we're gonna see that there's a big uh, big violation of that rule here as we kind of walk up this slope so these rocks here are all limestones again from the Cambrian and then you kind of quickly lose them here in this slope there's several rocks that have probably kind of come down but that characteristic gray color is gone here and if we go up a little further we can see some bigger rocks exposed just right here in the trail and these are these kind of greenish rocks with a little bit of a sheen to them we can see there's some other ones in here they've got a little bit of mica in them as well these are metamorphic rocks these are um, schists and phyllites and these rocks are pre-cambrian and so what happened is just down there we had cambrian 500 to 20 or so million year old limestones and now as we've gone up the hill the rocks have become older and they're not just a little bit older these rocks are uh, over a billion years old these are some really old metamorphic rocks furthermore metamorphic rocks form at uh, depth they they're crystalline rocks and so they form deep beneath the earth's surface whereas the sedimentary rocks down there form at the earth's surface and so the puzzle we have presented to us here is well how did this end up this way how did we end up with rocks that should be deep underground and are and should and are older on top of rocks that were deposited at the surface and are much younger and one good hypothesis would be well maybe the rocks were completely flipped over and in some places that's exactly what we see in this location though that's not the story and so the 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 answer to our, our riddle here is um what's happened to these rocks um not just in northern utah but throughout this section of the west over a period from about 130 to 80 million years ago during the cretaceous period um, and at that time this part of north america was being squeezed east to west compressed as a big uh, plate offshore was colliding with north america um, so as that plate was colliding with north america and sliding beneath north america it transmitted these compressive stresses basically squeezing the rocks east to west and what happened was um, rock layers that were weak in that stack um, became transported or were pushed to the east over the top of the younger rocks so you can imagine rocks these rocks these old precambrian rocks were once way out to the west maybe tens of miles maybe as much as a hundred or so miles but they were transported to the east and shoved over the top of these younger rocks these cambrian sedimentary rocks here so these types of fault systems are what we call thrust faults and um Along the crest of this part of the Wasatch Range, um, there's just a, a series of these slices of, of rocks that, that just don't match up with the rocks either above or below them. These are just pieces of rock that have been sliced and sheared and transported to the east um, during this period of, of uh, compression, uh, this, uh, this mountain building event uh, called uh, the Severe Orogeny. So pretty remarkable. Um, you can kind of see a similar relationship on this ridge over here and so you've got the the beige rocks we talked about before the little saddle a little bit of gray i'm pretty sure without going over there that's those same limestones we looked at uh, before uh, and then we've got some darker rocks um, which i believe probably match up with these precambrian metamorphic rocks another little slice of gray could be limestone i'm not sure and then this uh, second beige unit up here that's the exact same rock units that are down there so that beige quartzite that forms the big cliffs way down the canyon there is the same as what we see uh, up here just along the trail so again these these thrust faults 
um, can repeat rock units. Again, as they get compressed and they ride sort of piggyback style up over the top of other rocks, it repeats the section. Makes things confusing for geologists. You gotta pay attention um, and be aware and know your rock units well enough to, to differentiate them. Um, but it makes for some fantastic geology. It's essentially what's made this mountain range um, have some high peaks in it because we've actually been able to, uh, the thrust faulting has pushed some of these hard resistant rocks um, on top and they've uh, been uh, resistant to weathering and so they form some of these high peaks here like Ben Lomond uh, which is almost 10,000 feet here. As we look kind of south you can see the rest of the Wasatch Range here in northern Utah. So another great day, uh, more sexy geology and hope you keep enjoying these.